Thank you, choir. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, offertory. My goodness. Uh, absolutely awesome. Um, we've got some talented people here, and I'm grateful that they use it for the Lord. Aren't you? Amen. And on that, she leaves. What the, what the, what the, amen. Amen. Take your Bible, open it to uh, the book of Matthew, chapter number 20. We have uh, been studying what it means to be a God pleaser this spring. And uh, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 that the only way to please God is by faith. But that literally says that you can please God by faith. That if you are a person that seeks to have faith in your life, then that means that when God looks at you and how you are reacting to him, it puts a smile on his face. That's a wonderful thing. And by the way, let me just say, that's a wonderful way to live. That's an absolutely wonderful way to live. Just to, to, to not see things as difficult, but just to see that you've got a great big God. Now, uh, we've looked at some amazing stories, haven't we? We've looked at some times when when uh, uh, someone prayed, Joshua prayed, and the sun stood still for a whole day. That's a God work. We've seen people like Jonathan who said, I just believe that if I do this, that it is God's will and God will be there to bless and honor. And he did. God was just looking for someone that he could please. We've looked and we've seen some mighty amazing things, some mighty amazing stories. But, but let me remind you, God's not just looking for these huge leaps of faith, but he's looking for a group of people who will be faithful in the everyday steps of life. I'm grateful that what God put on the inside, God can keep out no matter what. He can bring out no matter what. I, I believe that that which is in me, which is Christ, is good for any circumstance, any situation. So if I have a need, I can call upon him and he'll meet the need. From the inside out, the wounds can be healed. The power of God can flow. What an amazing God that we have. It's not just the one, two, or maybe five times in, in your life that you see heaven fall. But it's the everyday trust that puts a smile upon his face. It's born out of a, re of a relationship with him. I serve a great big God. And there is nothing that I face that my God cannot handle. Nothing that I face. So why do we not trust him with our everyday circumstances of life? Why don't we? We know he's big. We know he can. We just lose our focus. We get our eyes on something else. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says that we as Christians are to walk by faith and not by sight. But can I say most days we walk by sight? Yes. We, we see what we see and we, we react to what we see. Amen. If it's big, it scares us. How many of us are afraid sometimes? Fearful. How many of us uh, look at that and say, that's too big? What are we going to do? And we, we say, I, I don't know that there's anything we can do. And then there are those times that if, if there's some circumstance that's not coming, we just do what we think is good and right. One of the things that blessed me in my life is in Proverbs, Solomon wrote in chapter 14, verse 12, and then he actually wrote it again in chapter 16, verse 25. He said, there is a way that seems right unto a man. And I believe that was his testimony. I believe Solomon would look at it and say, in, in my ordinary day, I would look at something and I would say, that seems right. It seems good. It seems beneficial. It seems like the, the blessed thing to do. But he said this, the end thereof are the ways of death. Now Solomon's saying this, and, and I pray that we catch this. Solomon is saying when we're walking by what we think and what we want and what we believe, that'll lead to death. But if we'll walk the, the, the faith walk, I don't know what I'm going to face today, but I know the one who does, and I will trust him every step of the way. And, and I don't have to be able to handle it as long as he is. Can I just say this? If you have something in your life that's bigger than you, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him. 
And the quicker we learn that, the quicker we realize that, we can stop fretting and we can start seeing the power of God unleashed in our lives. It's not about how big the circumstances are, it's how big the God is. And from the inside, are we willing to trust him in the everyday? What you might call mundane. You're only going to do that if you, if you keep your focus on him. When your focus gets on you, when your focus gets on the wound, when your focus gets on the hurt, when your focus gets on the hardship, when your focus gets on the addiction, when your focus gets on the brokenness, when your focus gets on that person who said something they should not have said or did something they should not have done, you have just stepped out of the grace of God and you're walking by sight. When God is saying we're supposed to live by faith and not by sight. So if you would, would you join me in looking in Matthew 20? Stand with me. We're going to begin in verse number 17. Matthew 20, verse number 17. Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes. They will condemn him to death, deliver him to the Gentiles, to mock, to scourge, and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. Let's just pause. Jesus had his focus on the mission that God had gave him. He didn't get sidetracked. He put his focus, listen, his energy. He didn't, he didn't chase rabbits. He didn't get off on, on all the other stuff. By the way, he's not griping. He's not complaining. He is telling them beforehand so when they would see it happen, they would then realize, know, and believe that God is God and he's got this stuff figured out. Verse number 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on the right hand and the other on the left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? They said to him, listen now, here is the the wisdom of the flesh. We're able. We are able. So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptiz baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard it, uh-oh, uh-oh, when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased. I believe that's a, I believe they could have exaggerated that just a little bit more and hit it. I believe they were very, very greatly displeased. They were, they were mad at the two brothers. And Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Let's pray. Father, this is your word. Jesus, this was your life. You spoke truth into them, but their eyes were on something else. Lord, their eyes were on their wants rather than your will. Father, you uh, tried to tell them to get their focus back on God. And I pray that you'll do the same for us today. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, speak. Draw us close to yourself. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise and the glory and honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I don't know how many times it was in the family of Zebedee that they sat around and talked about Jesus. Some friends of theirs in the family fishing business, they introduced them to Jesus, and they heard Jesus preach. 
they saw the crowds come. Matter of fact, there was a point in time that Jesus came by and, and, and said to them, follow me to two of their boys, James and John. And they did. They left the family business. And I know that that was, was a, probably a very hard thing for them and hard thing for a family. But, but you also know that there was some pride there too. Uh, Zebedee and his wife were saying, yes, go, please go. We really believe in this man named Jesus. The crowds are amazing and they're following him. And, and people are bringing uh, people to Jesus that have all kinds of sicknesses and heartaches and demons and infirmities. And, and he's never found a problem that he can't heal. He's got a great influence. People love to listen to him. They, they just will let him uh, preach and, and, and teach for days at a time. Oh, they loved Jesus, but they were also tired of the world in which they lived. They were tired of Rome. They were tired of the soldiers all over the place. They were tired of the taxation. They were tired of, uh, of Rome could come in at any time and do anything from the, to them, and they had nothing that they could say back in return. And when you've got leaders like Herod and Pilate, it wasn't good. And they had read Scripture. They had been to synagogue. And they probably read Isaiah, Jeremiah, and some of the other prophets of old that told them that, that God would send a Savior, that God would send a Messiah, a Christ, the anointed one, and he would deliver the people from the hardship, and he would, he would lead in righteousness. James and John were there when their friend Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So you know they had conversations in their family. You know that there was a buzz that was there. You know that they were thrilled because they truly, listen to me now, they truly believed in Christ. They, his power was unquestioned. Amen. But yet, their focus was off. They probably were sitting around the table and talking about what it would be like when, when Christ reigned on earth and, and Rome was gone and the temple was back to the place of, that it should be and, and, and worship, all the people in the world coming to worship once again the one true God, how great it would be. By the way, he called you and, and, and James, John, I mean, you're part of the inner three. Wouldn't it be great when he comes into his kingdom? Wouldn't it be great for you? I mean, you could be a ruler. You could have power. You could have new chariots and authority, and, and, and you, could, you could speak. And whatever you say, people would have to do. Now, listen, that's the normal views of life. When your focus is not on God, but it's on you. I mean... Surely he's got to have somebody rule with him. And James and John probably nodded their heads. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, that'd be good. Yeah. Whew. Man, I, yeah, we, that'd be good. Well, talk to him about it. Oh, no, no. Uh-uh. I could never. Right? Well, Zebedee's wife said, well, I'll talk to him about it. You know moms, don't you? <laughs> my boys. Ain't nobody can serve like my boys. I, I want to see my boys up there. So she went to Jesus, and she knelt down before him. By the way, in Scripture, the word bow down is the same word for worship. But I think it's unique. She didn't come to worship for who God is and what he was about to do for them to give his life a ransom. She came in worship, but she's really thinking about herself and her boys. And Jesus could have walked away. Jesus could have said, uh, ma'am, excuse me, I got something I need to do. But he understood that this needed to be confronted. And one of the things that Jesus did was he was always ready to teach truth. And by the way, my prayer is that because the Holy Spirit is God, when he is in this place, 
He will come and amplify the word of God because it's not everything that God knows, but it's what he wants us to know. And he'll amplify truth in our lives. We need that today. Amen. We need to be drawn closer to the plumb line that it's always good, it's always right, it's always true. So he looks at her and says, look what he says in verse 21. What do you wish? What do you want? What's on your mind? And she said, um, um, grant that these two sons of mine may sit on your right hand and on the other in your kingdom. That's a bold request. So Jesus said, uh, number one, you don't know what you're asking for. Can you drink the cup? Can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? Listen to the pride of these men. We are able. It wouldn't be long after that that the soldiers would come and take Jesus and the high priest Caiaphas would take him to Pilate. You know the story. They would beat that man, scourge him, mock him, spit in his face, pull out his beard, slap him with their hands, beat him with rods, crucify him on the cross, and all they got from Jesus was love. Are you able? But where were they? They weren't there. They are gone. Are you able? Yes, we're able. They were very able to, to be put on a place, a pedestal. They were very willing to be, to be lifted up where others would be under them. They liked, well, they didn't like what Rome had, but they wanted a little bit of it for themselves. They probably thought, I'll get back at old Pilate. I'll get back at the rest of them. Even Ananias and, and Caiaphas probably said, if we could just get rid of this Jesus, we could have the authority again. Are you able? Oh, yeah, we're able. Verse 23, he said, well, you will indeed drink my cup. You will indeed be baptized with the baptism. You don't have to look it up. You can look it up later. But in Acts chapter 12, Verse 1 and 2, James was killed with the sword by Herod. I don't know if they stuck him. I don't know if they came across him. I don't know if it took 20 seconds. I don't know if it took 5 or 10 minutes. I don't know if it took an hour for him to bleed out. I don't know any of those things. All I know is he was killed with the sword in Jesus' name. And his brother, he lived to his 90s. They couldn't shut that man up. He was a, a, a great preacher. He was a great mentor to others. When Peter died, John took over to mentor where young Timothy and John Mark to help them. He, he, he serves as the pastor of the First Baptist Church at Ephesus. Or at least that's what I call it. They told that man to hush. He said, you can't, I can't hush. They got boiling oil. Can you see that cauldron of boiling oil? We'll shut you up. You either quit, denounce, or we'll throw you in that boiling oil. I can't quit, and I will not renounce. So they threw him in that John, the apostle John, in that boiling oil. Only thing was they couldn't kill him. What do you do with somebody you can't kill? You put him out on the Isle of Patmos alone. If we, can't, if we can't shut him up, we'll just put him out there where he has nobody to minister to. But Jesus met him in Revelation 1, and he's been ministering to us ever since. Amen? Yeah, amen. Most believe that he wrote the Gospel of John, the book of Revelation, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, in his 90s. Oh, what great love. Indeed, you will be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with, but it won't be like you think. 
Then Jesus had a problem because the other disciples heard that. I wonder what Peter thought when he said, they said what? Right hand and left hand. I'll tell you who's going to be on the right hand and who will have the left hand. How dare they? And old Judas is like, if anybody's going to be in charge, I'll be in. I want to be the secretary of the treasury. Give me the money. That's what Jesus said. I don't know. But there was a fuss. Isn't it funny when pride gets out there, God always attacks, uh, or Satan always attacks relationships. And it's over those things that really don't matter. It really don't matter. I pray for his will and his way. For his glory. As far as I'm concerned, that's the only thing that matters. Whatever else happens in life, I'm good. I'm good. If you love me, amen. If you don't love me, he still does. Amen. If you want to speak truth into my life, amen. If you want to lie about it, I know somebody who is my advocate. And he will take care of me. I do pretty well. You, you honor me. You bless me, and God will bless you for how you bless another. I am, I am very grateful. I, 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 I do not deserve all that God has given me. I, I, am, I am honored to be your pastor. I am honored to, to be in this place and to love you in Jesus' name. But it's not about me, it's about you. And it's not about you, it's about Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Jesus had to set the record straight. So he looks over at him, and look what it says in verse number 25. Jesus called him to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. I mean, just look around. You see the soldiers? Man, it's ugly. You see what's going on? They have power, they have authority, and you don't have a choice. They lord it over you. Those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. Please hear the word of God. This is not the way it is in church, folks. This is not what the Christian life's all about. I don't mean to be rude, but it, it really doesn't matter. It's not about you. And, 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 and you may be tired. Get up and go to work. You may have think that you've fulfilled your task. As long as you're looking at me, God's not through with you. When you, God's through with you, you'll be looking at him and not me. So it's about the Lord's work. It's about the Lord's business. And, and, and our, the only retirement plan that, that the Christian has is being in the presence of God. But until then, we're about to be about his business. We're about to be serving. <clears throat> Look what he says. He says, yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to be great, among you, let him be your servant. He does not condemn them for having the desire to be used of God. Every one of us need to have a burden on our heart. Every one of us should have a desire to be pleasing, a God pleaser, a person of faith, fresh. I'm grateful for what you have done. But God's going to meet you in what you're doing and what he will do in your life. Look, my past sins are forgiven. Amen? I stand before you in forgiveness, and I'm going to walk forward in forgiveness. But I can't live on what I have done good for the Lord. I can't live on what I'm doing. I, I have to be faithful every step. It's not the huge leaps of faith that may have happened in your past. It's the everyday steps of faithfulness that flows from an inside of your heart. Before, this is not a, a dad's day sermon, is it? I thought about preaching about Abraham, you know, as he took Isaac up the mountain, but <clears throat> that's not a good dad's day sermon either. What are you going to do with your kids? Take them up in the mountain and kill them in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Though you may want to. No, no, no. I thought about that. And praise God that he was faithful. But listen, the one thing about Abraham, when he went up the mountain, 
He was expecting to come down the mountain with his son. He went up the mountain to kill him in Jesus' name, but he was looking for God to resurrect. He was walking out every day that if God placed it before him, God loved him, God would protect him, God would provide Jehovah Jireh. So he was willing to go up because he had a great big God that would bring his son back down with him. It's about serving the Lord when you understand. It's about serving the Lord when you don't understand. It's about his will. I serve at his pleasure. I will go wherever he wants me to go. I will do whatever he wants me to do because that's what we do every day. We say, yes, Lord, yes. It's not simply that, that I say, all right, God, I'm a preacher. You call me to be a preacher. Bring me all the millions of people and I'll set them straight in Jesus' name. No. I'm just supposed to walk it out every day. Listen, in my own heartache. Right? Because we all have it. Everybody in this room has hurts, habits, and hang-ups. There is nobody excluded. Everybody in this room has got junk. Whether you want to come in and act like it or not, everybody in this room has junk. And the thing is, is that God loves junk. Yep. And God takes that which the world breaks and makes it whole again in Jesus, makes it a trophy of grace. We are beautiful unto him. I love that, that the part of we are a sweet-smelling savor unto him. When we're walking it out in faith and we're trusting him, God says, my, that smells good. But the smell of pride, he will reject. But he'll give grace to the humble. It's not how big you are. It's how big he is. It's how small you can be in service. You know one of the things that brings excitement to the church? God's people living out their mission don't have to twist anybody's arm. They're just ready to come forward and say, Here my Lord, send me. Whatever small thing I can do, amen. I saw that this past week. I saw, you know, not the lofty positions, but people filling out those other positions. We had one night, we had 14, four, three and four-year-olds. Is that what it was? Four and five-year-olds. Pam was in there. <laughs> How many of y'all want to sign up for vacation? Y'all want to do vacation Bible school again this week? <laughs> Phyllis says no. <laughs> the altar will be open in just a minute, Phyllis. <laughs> Look. In his service, there are going to be things that you have to face. In his service, there's going to be opportunities to walk with him. It may be a dark road. It may be a lonely road. But it's God's road. I call it glory road. Glory road. What would it be like if the church said, here am I, Lord, send us? There would be more excitement in this place. It would be the most attractive thing. If, if, if a guest came into this place and they couldn't figure out who the leader was because everybody was leading and everybody was serving. Y'all hear me? Would that be attractive? Would it be different? The world doesn't look like that. But Jesus said, we're not like the world. It's not going to be that way among us. How do you keep it? Your focus. Give me two minutes and I will close. If you will keep your focus on Christ, you can have daily worship. <coughs> worship. Praise. Honor. Oh God, this is too big for me, but it's not too big for you. Give him praise. Oh God, I don't know what I'm going to do. But I know that you've got this figured out. Give him honor. Oh, Lord. Lord, this is messed up. This is broken. 
But Lord, this is a great place for your glory to shine. Worship him. But if your eyes get on you, you won't have your quiet time. If your eyes are worried about what you think and what you want, and you're willing to, to gossip about it and tell everybody else about it, but you're not willing to get on your knees and tell him about it. We lose our focus. And we don't worship. We need to have a heart, not saying, where can I lead, but where can I serve? That is your leadership. If Christ set the example, mm, have y'all ever heard the story of Jackie Robinson? Seen the movie 42, any of those things? When Branch Rickey got him, he knew he had a ball player. And he knew it was time. He knew it was time. And he looked at him and said, are you going to be strong enough to do this? And I don't know if, I, this is how they portrayed it. I'm not sure exactly all that he said, but you, you don't think I'm strong enough to stand up? And this is what he said. No, he said, no, no. I want to know if you're strong enough. I want to know if you're strong enough that when they insult you and when they come against you and when they speak vile against you and when they, all the ugliness of the world comes against you, are you going to be strong enough to keep your mouth shut and do what you're supposed to do and be the part of this team? Praise God Jackie Robinson was. Or we wouldn't be talking about him, right? My father sent my Lord. And it wasn't send him down there to show how big you are. He came down there to do the small stuff. Pick up a little child. Permit the children to come to me. Put up with Judas and all of his junk. Right? Put up with those whited sepulchers that were destroying Judaism. And go to the cross and say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And when they did all those things to him, he was strong enough to still be a servant, to keep his mouth shut. This is God's word. This is God's will. Will we obey? Are we willing to walk by faith? Or are we willing to put our focus still on sight? Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be in this place. Lord, to have a copy of the Word of God. Thank you for the privilege of preaching the Word of God today. Father, we want your will. Lord, we, you are mighty to save. You are the author of salvation. You are able. Father, help us today to get our eyes off of us. Father, we come with our wants. Oh, Lord, may we leave letting you supply our needs. Father, may it not be that there is a way that seems right unto us and we live that way. But, Lord, a life that is real to you. Father, I pray that in the next few moments in the time of this invitation that you will be real. If there's someone here that is burdened right now with their sin and they know that they need to be forgiven, they know that they need a Savior, I pray, Lord, that they will have the wisdom and strength to pray from their heart to you and ask you to forgive them, ask you to save them, to come in your life. Lord, may they pray that, uh, to confess their sins and allow you to come into their life and, and, and be one with them. And Lord, if there's someone in this room that that you put a, your finger on some area of their life. Father, I pray that we would just empty ourselves so that we could be filled with you. Lord, may this invitation honor you. May it bring you glory. May your will be done in the next few moments. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand, please? I'll be here in the front to accept you. If you need to come and join this church, if you need to come and confess your salvation, be baptized. If you need to come to be saved, whatever it is, the altar is open for you to pray. Would you just come?